I'm Sir Flobojan Thunderhammer. And I'm Teflon Frosthammer. And I'm Cabbage Tidehammer. And this is Whack. If Amp Guard Knighthood means anything, you can't knife a motherfucker and keep it. And the thing that people need to understand essentially about arts and sciences events is that your scores don't matter. Do you want a black phoenix or a white phoenix? Jeez, language, man. We're yeah, on right. a freaking podcast, for fuck's sake. Mind-blowing experience, right? Hello, everyone, and welcome to WACT, where we discuss topics important to the AmpGuard community at large and talk with interesting people from around the foam-fighting world. This week, we have on a guest that I personally have been wanting to have on for quite some time. This is, I'm going to mispronounce your name again, Darian Starik? Starik. Starik. Darian Stark uh, from the Kingdom of Neverwinter. Darian, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. And I, I, I might be wrong, but I think I'm your first in-person out of Kingdom guest. I definitely think that you are. Yeah. Um, yeah. We actually just picked you up from the airport, what, 45 minutes ago. <laughs> so, you and by know, the thanks. way, it was so gracious of WAC to comp my flights. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks to all of yep. our Patreons. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been great. <laughs> Please, Patreon, sign up. <laughs> Godric really carrying the load here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, so before we started, you were actually, um, I don't know which mouse is connected to that, um, but before we got started, uh, you were kind of telling some stories about like how you get your name and, and things like that, um, specifically I think how you got Stark, but why don't we start with how you got into AmpGuard in general, and we'll grow from there. Sure, absolutely. So um, you have to go back in time to about 1994, 1995-ish, um, some friends and I that were in Scouts together, we actually played this game where we had sticks and we just invented it ourselves, and we would actually sword fight and hit each other with wooden sticks. Oh, good. And um, we actually got pretty good at blocking because it hurt like heck <laughs> when, you, when you failed to block. We had no gloves, no equipment, no anything. We would actually just walk around the Scout camp and basically spar, you know, with our walking sticks. It's the same logic of if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge <laughs> right. a ball, right? <laughs> right? If you can dodge a wrench. Um, so there was a, a older guy that was probably about 10 to 12 years older than us um, that worked at the camp as well. And he saw we, we did this and it turned out he also was an amp carter. And his, oh, his uh, amp card name is Lord Quillian Reese. And he actually was a, a good friend of Roger Shrubstaff and they played D&D together and everything. And um, so he came to us and said, if you guys like sword fighting, you know, I do this thing. You know, he was probably early 20s at this point. We're all like, well, he was probably mid to late 20s. And we were probably all like, again, like 14, 15 years old. Right. And Mm -hmm. so um, we, in 1995, several of us visited their park, Silverwater, which was a little south of where I lived. And we played a couple times. And then from that, we, um, we decided we wanted to have our own park. So we created our own park called Windstorm Woods that was actually... Um, within like two miles of the exit of the scout camp. And so our, our original Windstorm Woods Park essentially was almost exclusively all scouts. We would go to a camp out and then we'd all exit the Boy Scout camp, go right down the road to a, <laughs> to a county park, and we'd play amp guard every Sunday. And um, that's basically how we grew our park to begin with. Oh, that's really that's cool. That's super cool. Yeah. So when I met you... We knew your park as the Blue Moose Park, which was your, was it a fighting company or a household at that time? It was a fighting company at the time. It's still a household. It's a household now. So we knew this as the Blue Moose Park because it was primarily Blue Moose that were there. But was that actually the core group? Was the Blue Moose these the, these people that you were in scouts with at the time, at least to begin with? I'd say, well, so the Blue Moose didn't even start in the beginning. We all just started playing Amp Guard. There was no companies. There was no anything. Um, and actually the blue moose started as a joke because, um, Bobo was a giant, um, Bullwinkle fan oh, perfect. and, and he actually, this uh, makes me like it so much more yeah, already. Right? And right. so, you know, at the time this was like boogie board shield tech. And so we all had like various boogie boards with, you know, different color, uh, duct tape as the covers. There was no cloth covers. At yeah. The time. Right. right. And so, um, Bobo, he just came out and he, had a shield that was blue moose colored and he had created a bullwinkle. Sorry. Um, no, 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 you're my fine. My mic awareness is not there yeah. yet. Um, <laughs> so he, he had created a bullwinkle head on his shield out of different colored tape. And uh, it just started as a joke that, you know, we like he would take the feel that everyone would like cower at the blue moose and it became just like a joke. And then it became like a cool thing to like be a part of the blue moose at the park. Um, That's awesome. But it wasn't, it wasn't exclusively... Like there were more members at our park 
and because of the scout presence, um, you know, it became a thing where like all the cool kids and scouts wanted to also do amp guard. So, yeah. I mean, we, we grew to like, you know, 30 plus members at some point, um, that was well beyond the blue moose core. So I love the phrase the blue moose. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> it's like one of the, the lantern cores. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Like that's where my head goes. So some of these people actually are still playing uh, today. Who were some of these founding members that kind of grew up with you? For whom are you responsible? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I, I can't say I'm responsible for anybody because again, we're, we were all just like friends that all started playing at the same time. But right. um, uh, Keldrick is still around. He was there mm-hmm. day one, and Keldrick is still, he's a member of the Seraphim Fighting Company, still around. Nice. Um, um, after about a year and a half of playing, one actually one of our first non scout recruits was Sir Nocturne Abuhugan. Mm-hmm. He yep. was hi- friends in high school with Keldrick. And so Keldrick brought him out to Windstorm Woods. And, um, you know, we, we took Nocturne to his very first event. Um, mm-hmm. so he was from our park and, you know, we played together. Um, we later, I actually, when I went away to college, <clears throat> I started Lost Woods in Tallahassee and there I recruited Nemo who turns out lived where Winston Woods was from. So, he, so, <laughs> so it also became like his home park, you know, when we weren't at college. So he, he, you know, he lived within like a 10 mile radius of where Winston Woods was. He just never knew. <laughs> That's what yeah, he right. Played. So Nemo is also from that park, and then Nemo's brothers. Um, uh, Bobo, I don't know if I mentioned Bobo. Um, yep. He mm-hmm. doesn't play because he currently lives in um, Duluth, Minnesota, but uh, he still very much wishes he was playing. Um, I got a buddy in Duluth who was like trying to figure out where Ampguard is up there, and I could not find anything for him. I wear some of their underwear sometimes. Not even <laughs> close to the same. Uh, <laughs> No, but we I, this is this is cool because I wanted to show that you know a lot of times these connections last for a very long time. And for any of our listeners in Neverwinter, you may have learned something about some of the the people from your kingdom there. That you know this was this would have been around that 1995 to let's say like 2001, 2002. Uh, even before then, because I went away to college in 1999, and although that part continued when I went away to college, and then I came back and visited, um, a lot of that you know formation of those friendships was probably 96 97 98 early 99 um and then you know they kept playing and i went away oh also um also from windstorm woods sorry i forgot to mention this but sir john delar who um he is a crown knight of one of the northeastern kingdoms i can't remember which kingdom but he started that park with us and you know we played with him every sunday and then he <laughs> went away to college to vermont or somewhere and never moved back but he is also oh, now a crown that's knight awesome. of that kingdom. so we actually have um three nights from Winstrom Woods. Um, <laughs> wow. That's and, pretty cool. Yeah. You know, and, and Lord Quilly, and I'm sure if he had kept playing, he would have been been knighted at some point as well. And then, you know, Keldrick, if he ever just decided to win a few more tournaments, would certainly be knighted. So, I mean, there, there's <laughs> yeah. a, an yeah. amazing core of people that, that are from that park that are still in the game in some fashion or another. It's very much like our Radiant Valley now, right? Well, Mystic yeah. Glade before. Mystic Glade, yeah. Radiant yeah. Valley. So this is going to be skipping over some stuff that we'll definitely be coming back to. But how did you get from, I'm starting this this park and I'm going off to college and making some friends that end up becoming longtime members to Weapon Master Viscount Sir Darian, where you are uh, now? What was... Uh, what what was your your journey through the the years that kind of kept you motivated? A raw hunger for power. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I have a raw hunger for power. Um, <laughs> well, I think those first couple years, um, we really just loved battle gaming and and just sort of being. We were true flurbs in every sense of the way. We did a monthly quest, um, so we would battle game, and then the last weekend of every month. We would take turns running quest. We had a great park that had a, you know, a wooded trail around the entire perimeter of the park. So we would take turns running quest for each other. And we were sort of in that state of flurby bliss for years. And act, and because at the time, you got to remember, this is like pre, pre-websites, right? There was no yeah. Facebook. There was no MySpace. There wasn't really, there was, I mean, I had internet, but it was like AOL dial up. You know, you were sitting on AOL instant messenger talking about. <laughs> Rules <Amgar>. clarifications <laughs> were handled with pistols at dawn. Right. Yeah. right <laughs> so, and God forbid you got a phone call while you were trying to search something, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So our first real experience to the outside world of Amp Garden, of course, we knew Silverwater existed, but at, for years, 
our entire like understanding of what amp card was was silver water and windstorm was we didn't we didn't know there was other stuff and I, I kid you not my first like real experience to like real whoop ass fighting <laughs> was <laughs> out of nowhere sir golwin shows up at our park with fruit loop just the two of them and they mm-hmm. had heard whispers on the wind that there was a park with some cool dudes across the state and they got in their car and they drove over and they showed up at their park and the two of them whooped our entire <laughs> park. <laughs> right. Right? And we just like, didn't even know, like it was a, you know, we didn't know that that was a thing that it was like competitive and people were actually like good at this, you know, outside of like slinging spells at each other. Right. Um, so that was probably my first like real, like, Oh, okay. We can actually like learn how to be good sword fighters and practice from that. And then from there, you know, we started upping our tech and upping our game and practicing more. Um, but you know, honestly, it was probably um, a little bit of friendship and a little bit of fanboying over Sir Golwin that probably pushed me to be uh, probably wanting to be a better fighter. Mm-hmm. You know, and later later on, I was belted to him, and then I was in the triads. So I became a good fighter as like part of that growth. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, that was probably my my first step along the path. Um, <laughs> and then from there, it's just been, I've always been playing and I've always loved the battle game, loved the ditch. And, you know, eventually if you hang in long enough, you, you figure some stuff out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> and so your belt specifically, or at least the first belt that you received was a serpent belt. Um, and I think that, Within your kingdom, you're known for quite a few things uh, up to this point. You uh, have taken several leadership positions over the years. You've, uh, I think, have a pretty high up there in Orders of the Warrior as well. Um, again, a lot of things that you collect along the way. Uh, I always, I this is probably not fair, but I will always think of you as a serpent knight because I watched some of the really beautiful work that you were uh, putting out. What got you interested in doing ANS and specifically some of the armors and stuff that you have done. Sure. Um, so the first piece of armor I ever made was, um, I saw somebody, I think it was even at a boy scout thing. They made armor out of soda can tabs. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. I've seen plenty of this and 15 year old me thought that is the coolest thing ever. So, uh, so I actually made a full, like sort of like a Lando Calrissian shoulder cape out of, um, Oh my gosh, really cool. Speaking my language. um, (laughs) Go on. So I I may or may not have procured the cape from someone in band at my high school. (laughs) And and then then I, I, you know, added the soda can tab armor to it. And it was sort of like a Nighthawk thing. I could be like, you know, and have like soda armor. Um, (laughs) You remember the silver hawks? I I I I know that too. (laughs) I was forged on 80s cartoon. (laughs) Um, Okay, we'll just slide this over. (laughs) You're right. Um, I I had the 1980s version of that, I'm sure. Um, (laughs) And so, you know, I made that and like, that was my first like, like step into making stuff. And then, um, it was actually a few years later, my younger brother, Shaq, I don't know if you remember Shaq. I do. Yeah. So he actually, um, I came home, like I I was at like scout camp for a couple of weeks and I came home and in the interim he had made a chainmail jig and I started making chainmail. (laughs) So I come home and I'm like, you know, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm making chainmail. And I was like okay like okay obviously i need in on this and so my brother and i started making chainmail together and we both made our own like first sets of chainmail like together like sitting that's in house. really cool um and so yeah it was my younger brother who taught me how to make chainmail um and then i just never stopped and you know i realized it's a so i was driven to make armor because at the core i'm a battle gamer and i'd like to win battle games right yes and you need to do everything you can to get to have every advantage you can in a battle game, especially, you know, for your, your melee based classes. Mm -hmm. And if you're not armoring up, you're just not, in my opinion, doing it right. And so I, you know, made myself armor, but then my, you know, my team isn't great if I'm the only one with armor. So then I made my friend's armor and I made my (laughs) friend's armor. and And then as you add people to your company, I just kept making armor and then I just never stopped. Um, 
And, you know, I, I went to seven years of college and I learned I could make chain mail in a lot of my classes if the class was big enough. So <laughs> I would bring my chain mail to class and I'd sit in the back and I would make chain mail all through college and law school. We, nice. The triads actually still have a set of armor that we refer to as the Darien armor because it had the six in one over, across the shoulders and, and down because the armpits and shoulders were always what used to blow out for us. Mm-hmm. Um, we still have that sitting somewhere. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think that was actually the first shirt of armor I ever made. Oh wow! And I, I gave it to Zeb when he visited Windstorm Woods. Yeah, yeah. Hell of a welcoming gift! Holy crap! I think my favorite one that I remember from you is your your coif that has little dangly yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. I, I I put that up at one of the Neverwinter auctions <gasps> a couple of years ago. No, I'm so mad that I didn't know. <laughs> like I straight up would have bought it. <laughs> I mean, we've all been in that. Like, hey, we got to get all the buddies armored up. I've I've been at you know Sir Gillen's house grinding plates until two in the morning before <laughs> burning your feet. Yeah, because um, I was wearing no shoes. Yeah, uh, as as was very intelligent at the time. Yeah, that yeah, was fine. <laughs> Just put a towel over my feet. So you've done more than armor work as well. You've done uh, some work in other ANS areas uh, too. And if I'm not mistaken, you've actually uh, set up some pretty interesting tournaments uh, down there uh, as well. What other areas of ANS have interested you over the years? Um, So I have seven Garbers and it's actually been a handful of years since I've made anything because my only sewing machine is 80 years old. <laughs> and, uh, that probably means it's a great sewing machine. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. It has a 1.5 horsepower motor on it and I can <laughs> stitch through one eighth inch leather. Uh, and also without, you're not without, using it to sew, it's a go-kart. Yeah, you know? exactly. so, um, a little hard to sew linen with it. Though. <laughs> so, oh, I can imagine. Yeah. So I, I, I keep meaning to buy like a new modern sewing machine so I can get back into making more garb, but then I just have all these other crafts and I just never end up sewing anything. So is this that you're wearing now something you've made or no, is this okay. absolutely not? So this is from linengarb.com. Okay. I okay. bought it like a couple of weeks ago, which is nice. wonderful because uh, I wanted something lighter that I could just stuff in my carry on. Fair. Um, so yeah, so leningard.com, great website. Hey, highly 100%. highly recommended from the WAC crew as well. I think uh, we all have linen garb at this point. Well, I don't no, know. No, I don't have anything yet. Your your wife just makes you amazing garb, and then it just sort of turns up sometimes. Being married yeah. to a serpent knight must be nice. Well, I buy my <laughs> stuff at linen garb. But, um, so, I mean, I've sewed lots of things. Like in the Blue Moose days, I sewed lots of things. But Bobo and I sewed the first five serum tunics, and then after that, I, myself, and I sewed the next 22 of them. I, myself, and I? <laughs> I actually still have Bobo's pants. The, the <laughs> pan, the sand, so Bobo put together some pants, and Darren comes up to me. He's like, hey, can I, can I talk to you for a sec? Like, yeah, sure, Darren. You can talk to me. I, it, how do you feel about pants? Oh, like them, wear them most days. <laughs> and he said, Bobo sewed these. Bobo, of course, longtime friend. The uh, Bobo sewed these, and once he'd finished, he held them up and said, they're perfect, and then realized that they were another fighting company, one that I used to belong to, the uh, Sons of Raw, which is mm-hmm. sand and black. Uh, and I still I, I still wear them around as like house pants. They're that comfortable. He, he was so happy with that color combination. So, yeah, man, that looks great. It looks great on the Sons of, Sons of Raw. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Bobo was, was tall like me as well. So. so wait, serious question here. The the seraphim tunics are, the <clears throat> colors are celery. I know that specifically. And then there's a green that I, whatever is nothing. And then like a gray, right? The greens to me all kind of blend in, but celery sticks out. Were you the person that chose those colors? Bobo and I did. Yeah. So it, it's charcoal, hunter green, and celery. Okay. And then the wings are white with silver trim. Um, we specifically chose celery mm-hmm. because you can't accidentally copy it <laughs> that makes sense gonna ask is how did you get celery as a okay the two of us <laughs> went to a joann's and we we said okay we know we want like a hunterish green and so we you know we we dug out the dark greens and picked out the one we liked best mm-hmm. and then we knew we wanted something dark but not black and so we we migrated towards the charcoal and it just happened to look really good with the hunter green Sure. And then we went down every other green combination and we landed on celery because you, you can't accidentally do that. You have to intentionally, <laughs> you have to intentionally buy celery. celery. Okay. Okay. I like it. To be, so to level with you, the reason I'm asking is because I thought it was the same as Mystic Glade colors for a long time because Glade colors were green, gray, and yellow. And for me, celery, yellow, 
are the same thing. Like, just they kind of merge. And so I was like, why celery, though? Were they trying to mimic? And they're like, no, those are totally separate colors. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then why celery? So now we know at least. That's Can you it. actually see celery? Oh, like, not joking. No, I mean, like, when it comes with the, the wings, I see the little sticks. No, I can't. Like, I thought it was yellow. I thought celery was always yellow. I'm not sure if the wing thing was just a brilliant tie-in to the fact that they have wings as part of the thing, or you were Could making be. it. Yeah. Could be totally accidental. It's definitely accidental. So, uh, <laughs> one thing that I want to touch on here, too, because I think that this is important, especially we've done a lot of work where we've talked to some of our younger listeners or people at newer parks or something like that, but one thing that was mentioned in passing that I wanted to touch on again was you originally were part of the triads. You are not part of the triads now. Last you are, time I checked. Yep. You're part of the, uh, <laughs> you're, you're part of the, uh, the seraphim. Um, let me check their website real quick and see if it's on the roster. Hold on. <laughs> I check the wiki every once in a while. Just you never know. <laughs> um, the, uh, your picture in the wiki, by the way, at your nighting is really cool. Um, Thanks. the, uh, this is something that I think for younger parks is a huge thing. It was, I was in the triads when this happened. It was definitely like a, an emotional thing for everyone involved, but um, we don't have to get far into the weeds in it. Talk to me about what it was like making the decision to leave a fighting company with some people that, as you had said, you know, these were friends, you'd gone to roller coasters uh, together and done all kinds of fun stuff. We may have been talking about that a little bit uh, before we got on the show. And then you've decided to go and and form this other fighting company. Because I think that's an important story to tell. Sure. Uh, we're still, the point the point that we're getting at is we're still friends today correct right you correct. and I are talking right now and I think that a lot of these younger parks see this as the end of the world and we can't talk to these people anymore and there's a point where you have to say that this is a game and there's a lot of different reasons that people may do stuff like this well with old fighting companies especially that that could have been a thing I know you regularly talk about like it, it's joked that like oh Flo's gonna be a seraphim and then you know Zeb gets all paranoid and then like you know, it's a fun joke to play. Yeah, but on, that's but true, though. I'm in every fighting company. I'm, <laughs> yeah, li- yeah. I'm literally in all of their chats. Yeah, yeah. You've got all the tattoos. You know, I, I've seen it. I don't think that I'm in the 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 actual Seraphim chat, though. I've tried. I asked them to slip me in and just name me. Certainly not Flo. Yeah, yeah. You're in the Seraphim chat for the purposes of making people paranoid. Flo has yes. been to more Seraphim retreats than I have been. To. <laughs> so that's true. That's accurate. But yeah. Okay. So to get uh, to get back to the question. That was kind of the direction that I was wanting sure. to talk about. There with so let me let me go back up a little bit from my perspective of how like we even got to the triads before we split the triad. Sure, yeah. yeah. Fair. So um, you know the the original founders of the triads were rogues, and they decided to leave the rogues for whatever reason. I wasn't really privy to at the time, but we knew at the time. You know the the sort of the biggest players I think in the kingdom were in Neverwinter were the Blue Moose and the Sons of Ra, and both mm-hmm. at the time considered themselves fighting companies. But when we knew that Chow Hag, Stinkfoot, and Golwen had left the um, rogues and were going to start their own thing, and they sort of broadcast out there they were going to start their own thing, there was actually like cross-company discussions between the Sons of Ra and the Blue Moose where we each decided to turn ourselves into households with the hopes of feeding our best fighters into this new thing, whatever it was going to be. Okay. And so that started to happen and, you know, they immediately picked up Zeb and then they immediately picked up Nocturne. And then there were some other sons of Ra that like folded in, you, you know, you, you beefy, you beefy mm, and then me they, later. Yeah. Then they folded in Keldrick from the blue moose. Mm-hmm. Um, some time passed. Um, Did Keldrick get in before you? Keldrick was in way before me because, Oh, um, we can get into that other story, but there's a reason why there was a reason before I was a triad that Zeb also didn't like me and, <laughs> and, and it had to do with that, that scuffle that we talked about on the, the truck ride here. Sure. So I was blacklisted from the folding in, but I didn't know it. I never knew there was a problem. Um, you know, so Keldrick was in years before me. Um, and then later Zeb and I had a talk and we worked it out. And then they folded me in, and then they folded in another Sons of Ra, and then they folded in a Nemo from the Blue Moose. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and then so it came down to where everybody from that initial, we're all going to push ourselves to be triads, everyone was in Bobobo. 
every single one of that list was in but Bobo. K, K, we had another member in the Sons of Raw that had not wanted to do the merger, wanted to continue, and so he had, he had stepped back. But yeah, I think that all of the other... Well, the, the Moose had other Moose, but at, when we decided to become a household, we knew we had... Some of our roster just weren't the fighters, and we knew it was probably better for them to be in a household with us than it was to be in a competitive fighting company. Sure, yeah. But just like, for, like, managing expectations. Right. Or, yeah. But, like, our, 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 you know, our A-listers were, like, the ones we always figured would fold in. Everyone was folded in but Bobo. And eventually there was a point where there was starting to be some tension in the triads because a lot of triads wanted Bobo. And I remember we had that – it was a – big event and we were all there and they sat us down and they said you know the next two members were going to be teflon and subway and almost everyone in the room was like what about bobo two and more it, two more people from you know this was for to give some context here sorry to interrupt <clears throat> this was kind of a north south split at the time so we had a lot of people from up here in the north and then a lot of uh, southeast down there too and i want to say too the whole point of this is not to bring up old company drama anyone from these two kingdoms well that... if it's any consolation none of those three are in the triads now <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> true so... the, the the point of this isn't to bring up old kingdom drama or anything like that i really want to for for I'm getting there i'm getting to the payout yeah for anyone that has had to uh that has wondered about like uh, companies or you're in a company and you've had a good friend leave or something like that. I, it's, I think it's important to address the story on air and I don't know if we've ever done it. So probably not, probably not. So, so we're, we're a lot of people were like, what about Bobo? And I think even Zeb like told Gowen, like Bobo needs to be in this company. And I don't remember exactly the reason why, but Gowen said Bobo will never be a triad period. End of story. Oh, and, and everyone in the room was like starting to make the pitch and Gowen said, Bobo will never be a triad. Jeez. So we walked back to our cabin, the, the moose who were triads, we walked back to our cabin and it was just unanimous. Like, well, we have to quit. Like he's our best friend and he deserves to be a member. And if he can't be a part of it, then we need to be a part of something with him. So we all immediately, like with 30 seconds of discussion, took our tunics off and walked them back and handed them in. That's a show of solidarity I can get behind. That's really cool. It was all about being something in something with our friend who we thought deserved to be in it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, I won't tell the story for the other people that were mentioned, uh, in here for, for Zeb or for Golan or anyone. I was a very young member at the time. I actually was the one, we had a tradition that the last person that was in inducted the next person. So I was, I was the person (laughs) that inducted Darian. I still have the foam finger sealed too. (laughs) And for, for, for my induction, I wanted to go uh, silly because everyone was always super serious about it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I got clown shoes <laughs> and a little like nose <laughs> and a big foam finger that was a shield. It was a punch like, shield. Uh, triads it, it number, one. number one. Yeah, yeah it was a, the, the number one. Um, and uh, we went out and ditched. And the rule was that Darian had to ditch, I think, all that night in like <laughs> funny clown clothes that was triad. I'm fairly confident that I'm the best fighter who's ever fought in clown shoes. <laughs> oh, I'm willing to go on the record and say that. They were like two <laughs> people. Like, to give it to you, I don't know how we can check that. But yeah, I'm I'm not going to try to tell the story from any of their perspectives. It's a hundred different viewpoints. Yeah, they may have different takes on it. I will say as a young member at the time, it was really devastating uh, for me because the thought always goes to, well, like, what did what did I do wrong? Like, how could we have prevented this sort of thing? So at the time, definitely emotionally, uh, um, a, a very emotional thing. Like, there were people crying and stuff like that. Uh, but over time, uh, that you you get past stuff like that, and I think that's the real uh, takeaway here is your your fighting company in the in our game, your household in our game is not your identity. And while it is very important and it's a fun thing to do with your friends and things like that, you cannot tie it in indemnically to who you are. Doing that, I think, is a step too far. Um, and, uh, you know, I everyone involved has a different level of relationship now. You know, it's been a long time since this happened too. Other things may come into play. But uh, I, I think that I can fairly say that while all of the people involved might not be best friends now, 
there goes my Coke bottle. While all the people involved might not be best friends now, I think that even after all of this happened, all of us have at some point worked together towards common goals and there's a level of mutual respect there and things like that, right? You were at my wedding. I was. I was. Did you officiate that one too? No, I didn't (laughs) officiate that one. Uh, But I do want to say, you know, um, all I ever wanted to be in AmpGuard was a triad. That was my goal. You know, and Golan Go- Go- was <laughs> Golan was my hero, and he I think he he taught me how to fight to a point, and it was all I ever wanted to be was a triad. Like that was my goal. It was it was that above knighthood, above everything else, and quitting the company was the single hardest thing I've ever done in Amcard. It was, but it, it was, was one of the single hardest all, things for me to do when I quit as well. But it was all about standing with my friend. That's all mm-hmm. it was. That's fair. Um. So. We have covered a lot of your younger time in the game. We've covered some of your stuff leading up to your Serpent Belt and the things that you found fun there. But that's not the only thing that you did. I mentioned that you've done a lot of leadership stuff too. So, Well, he's the, the first Lord of Neverwinter, right? Yeah. One of the things that we learned when we were reading over your wiki <laughs> is that you received the first Lord title that Neverwinter ever gave well, out. The first title, period. That Neverwinter oh, the first title, please, period. Please get it right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now, to be fair, I don't think I deserved it at the time. It was given to me, but... This is a common thread. Everybody yeah. that gets a, a title or a, anything like that, they always feel like they didn't deserve it. Uh, I think Sir... Was it Sir Michael who also said like yes. he, got a, he got a crown belt and was like, I don't deserve this, but... Because the rule back then was when you serve two terms, why, yeah, okay. you, you get it. Mm-hmm. You, know, you are not alone in that thought. I think everybody who gets the, so the brass ring. I would love to just project this humble pride thing but really how it went was roger said so you're going to college and i said yes and he said so you're moving to another city and i said yes and he said are you going to start at Ampgard park there and i said yeah i planned to and he said get down on your d <laughs> he made me a lord and i said roger i don't deserve this he said it'll be easier to start a park if you're a lord <laughs> i mean was it i guess you can't know if you weren't not a lord but it seems like it'd be easier right it was hard. I mean, again, this was, I, so I moved to Florida. I went to Florida State and Tallahassee. There was no foam there. Again, this is like very early internet. And so I put flyers up in all the dorms. And then for about two and a half months, I stood by myself in garb and armor and all my weapons on the green and just watched everybody walk by <laughs> Damn. and waited until that one other dude came and said, oh, I saw the flyer. And then him and I played just the two of us for about a month and a half. And then, uh, you know, fast forward a year later and we were a uh, very, very healthy barony of like 36, 37 active players. That's awesome. That's nuts. That growth does pick up kind of exponentially as you get more people. Well, also like the determination of the people who start the park is yeah, a absolutely. big deal. The, the just being out there by yourself trying to trying to get people in is a lot. I, that was something that something that Zeb told me when I was really young is just a whole lot of him getting started when, mm-hmm. when he started up a, a, a park at his uh, college was a lot of him just standing out there alone. Yeah. Donnie actually was with him then. Him and Donnie were in high school or in college at the same time. That's but cool. So this is a lot of work, starting up your own park, which you've done twice. Especially back then. <laughs> yeah, which, yeah. Uh, definitely back then, which you've done twice at this point. And the second one... Uh, more people around, you know, you've grown to a really healthy park at this point. This is kind of dipping your toes into uh, into the leadership uh, stuff. But you transitioned, a lot of this has been local park focused, and you transitioned, uh, transitioned into doing more kingdom level stuff at some point. What was the spark for that? So I've actually, I never have run for any office. What I've, all of my kingdom level positions, which is not a lot, but... I pick up when when people quit. So I, oh, so I you're volunteer a pro tem. and I yeah I I, I was trying <laughs> to get to a crown that. belt by only being pro tem, but then eventually never <laughs> when I decided pro tems don't count. Um, so yeah, no, we've I, got uh, that dumb rule here too. So I, I've only Did just, we get rid of it. No, no, pro no. tem still no. technically doesn't count. So I've only just picked bullshit. up other people's slack is all I've done. Have you done any work on the board of directors? I was on the BOD for a couple terms Mm -hmm. while I was in law school and um, I I ended up having to resign because they were, they were deciding to do a fighting pit with gambling involved. Oh yeah. You guys, this is, this is completely legal in our state. And they said, Oh, well we need to raise money. And I said, yeah, but it's, it's completely legal. And they said, well, how about we sell 
Neverwinter Gold for real money, and then they bet the Neverwinter Gold. And I said, well, that's still exactly illegal. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, Turns out, still crying. And, yeah, and I said, so we can't do this, guys. And then they voted to do it, and I said I resigned because I can't be in law school and like on a board of directors yeah. that's voting to do illegal stuff. It's funny how often people that don't have the any kind of knowledge of this are like, this sounds like a fun and easy thing to do. It's fundraising. Yeah, oh, sure. right. It's also bad, but you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I mean, I was on the BOD for a time, and then I stepped off, um, and then I I haven't run again for that. Um, and but then there was a point where like Glenn and I rewrote the entire Kapora soup to nuts. Yeah, and it was a fantastic Kapora, and then we came to an all thing, and it was voted down because no one had read it. Oh yeah. yeah. That's a, just about to happen to me here. In, I was going to say, that, this I sounds say, like a precursor for you there. <laughs> yeah, not just me. There is a, a really, really good crew of people uh, that we've been working on a, on a Kapoor with. Uh, and so all you know, six or so of us look forward to it being shot down after no one reading it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's hard because people like instinctively vote no to change they don't understand. And to understand it, you have to read a whole Kapoor. Yeah. And so yeah. what do you do? How do you solve that problem? You don't. I mean, I don't. It, people have suggestions. Be very please. general in your cavors. That then, way, you can't do anything. And I know you're trying to like bait more leadership stuff out of me, Flo. But um, the the reason why I specifically haven't run for <laughs> for like amp guard level kingdom leadership is because uh, you know this, but I've the last twenty years I've been involved with multiple nonprofits where I am on the board of directors. I do a lot with the Boy Scouts of America, the Scouts BSA program now. That's why I'm here in town. I'm at one of the national meetings. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. um, the last six years, I've been on the board of directors for the American Hiking Society, which is a oh, cool. it's a national nonprofit yeah. with a yeah. million and a half dollar a year budget, and you know we service the entire country. And I was the chair for the last two years. So that's awesome. Holy so crap. Amp Guard specifically is my fun time. I that's do fair. leadership everywhere else in my life. So, and eventually I'll be too old to fight. And then, I'll, <laughs> and then I'll bring that experience to do leadership. Right yeah. Now. And I might have been, I actually knew some of that. I might have been bringing in some out of context stuff into the Amp Guard stuff uh, too. But that makes sense. And I, I want to take a moment to point out here too, something that we've said before. Draw, draw boundaries for yourself. I actually think that it was Sir Golan that said, S decide on what game you want to play in Amp Guard and then play it. And don't let, other people intimidate you or bully you into doing other things. So I think that that's really cool. Yeah, Lauren. <laughs> oh, I was gonna, I was gonna make a dig at Lexi. <laughs> you should be a serpent knight. No, <laughs> but you, you, you're qualified for it. No. Yeah. What's part of no? To circle back to one of your first questions about the different A and S stuff I do, I also. Mm -hmm do a lot of specifically knight's chains now mm -hmm. <laughs> um which is like making chain mail but different yeah and so i make a lot of like very intricate knight's chains not just for neverwinter but also for some like winter's edge knights and i just i made a really cool chain for sir testicles and and mailed it out to him yeah. um so it's it's probably one of the things i'm like my name is sort of being associated with now maybe even more than making armor but making you know, really, really um, sort of awesome night's chain. Yeah. It's like making chain mail, but somehow more expensive <laughs> and more time consuming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, uh, like I, when when uh, Sir Nocturne and, and Sir Venus got their third belt, I made them matching tit titanium chains that were, you know, the actual colors of the three belts they have. And Titanium. And, I'm sorry for your hands. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's very tough. <laughs> oh, man. And, and I, so I made them matching, and they actually, like, nest in each other. The materials cost alone was $180, mm -hmm. yeah. not to mention my time. Yeah. yeah. And just to point out to anyone that wants to do that, that's not a normal cost for chain mail. I have a bag sitting right here that came from Ringlord, and the entire bag with the pliers, I think, cost me like 30 bucks, and I've made multiple chains with it at this point. None yeah. of them were good. It's just, well, it's when you get it to like <laughs> nice chains where you really want to put the, the effort in that I can, I've seen it go way up. Yeah. Yeah. You How do many? a lot of judging, too. I do. Yeah, yeah. I've seen you judge at quite a few uh, ANS competitions. I correct me if I'm wrong, but when Olympiad came to Neverwinter, were you a judge for that? Um, I don't think I judged the ANS for that. I was one of the people who reeved the fighting tournament portion. Oh it yes, was Michael Imhog, myself, and I can't remember who else. Um, but it was basically Imhog ran it, and then I was like his 
assistant. Okay. Um, I, I had the pleasure of reaving the board fight between Brennan and Goldwyn. Oh, no. Oh, well, that one was fun. Yeah. If you remember how that one I remember And they that both one. looked at me and said, Reeve. <laughs> and I was like, uh, <clears throat> well, guys. Flip a coin. Yeah. Uh, it was. Um, so, yeah, I don't think I did the ANS for that Olympiad. But, um, yeah, I will always judge any ANS anytime I'm asked, no matter where I am. I remember I actually submitted you put myself s- in the worst position. <laughs> yeah, ever. right. I, I do. I mean, it's it's my yeah. primary obligation as a serpent knight. So, I remember yeah. after you got your belt, I submitted myself as an entry into one of your <laughs> ANS tournaments. <laughs> okay, walk me through how that works. What do you? Well, so Darian was the one that was taking all of the entries, and I filled the form out absolutely correctly and he looked over this and said he's gonna have to disqualify me um and i said well why would you disqualify me i am literally the best flow there and he said it's because i i didn't make me (laughs) and so it's he's gonna have to reject the entry um so tell us a story about the first time you slapped flow that's That's, that's really cool (laughs) i thought you just did cookies no no brownies no, the circus peanut no, pie. No, I oh, I man. did make that one time. <laughs> that was um, you. Okay. So, uh, now you're older. You've been in the game for a long time. Um, what are your interests? <laughs> Longer? Yeah. Hey, we it's it's rare that we have you're a guest. Older, you're impossibly aged and wizened, <laughs> and just just tack some stuff on there. Yeah, uh, a, a relic um, in many ways. God. Um, I know that you are still competing, or at least the last time we had spoken about it, we're still competing in the fighting tournaments, looking to see if you can work towards your sword belt. Um, what parts of the game do you find fun now? So uh, I have my ninth order now, and if you follow the conversion with the wins I have, it would convert me to Warlord. That's still you know up in the air if that's going to be a thing. Um, Neverwinter's only had, I think one full tournament since covid yeah and right. I, like i drove up to it and i got there a little late but there was only like a handful of people competing in it i'm not sure if they even would have awarded anything from it was so, this the one that, at uh, stinkfoot's nighting uh no so that i mean that was an iron man tournament oh okay. I, I mean like we've had one actual like qualls tournament um, yeah since since covid yeah um so, I mean, I haven't actually, like, competed in a little while. And, you know, frankly, COVID wasn't too kind with me. I actually <laughs> traveled for a scout thing, um, another meeting like this when I'm in town for, before we knew what COVID was. Like, it was already out in the world. Oh, gotcha. But it was before anybody knew what it was. So, like, February-ish, something yeah, it, like that. Yeah, it was that. literally February 2020. And I came home, and I was, like, totally fine. And within hours, like boom out and for four days like i slept like my wife didn't know what was going on like yeah i woke up and didn't realize i slept for four days oh man and then you know i was going to all these doctors and i was having trouble breathing but like no doctors could do anything because i had already gone through whatever it was there was no test to even test if what i had was covid right. it wasn't even widely like you weren't even widely aware of what it was at that yeah point. yeah right, right. correct so um and so they started treating my symptoms you know but not I mean, just, it was sort of like a bandaid kind of deal. Right. But I ended up basically not being able to really breathe for about eight months. Oh, Um, wow. I could not sit here and talk to you like we're talking. So, um, you know, so like exercise dropped, like everything, you know, gain a little bit of weight. Um, So eventually started to get through that. Lungs got better, you know, and so. Now I'm at a point where I could like get back in the saddle, but then, yeah. but then without like parks meeting and fighting, it's just like, you know, I, I got to shake some rust off. So it's kind of like this weird thing where if you look at my tournament record and if you follow the conversion chart, like I have enough second place kingdom wins alone to get me to eight or nine or whatever you can get <laughs> yeah. on second place. And then you add my three tournament wins. You know, I, I'm not a dominant tournament fighter, but my record is nothing to shake a stick at. Right. Um, right. So but it's also like if you convert me, I actually earned it like three years ago. It feels a little anticlimactic, and then also like like who I am today. Do I feel like a warlord? Like, gee, I don't mm-hmm. know. Well, you um, you mentioned like you you would judge every um, you know every ANS thing because you felt like that was your obligation as a serpent knight. Like, what is the obligation as a, a sword knight, and is that something you want to like tackle? Right. So 
the other thing is that I will also always jump into a tournament and reeve when it okay. needs it. So like I reeved at the Stingfoot's Nighting. Yeah. I reeved that. That's kind of what um, I figured. You know, I have I have myself like withdrawn from tournaments because I needed reeves, even though I was like one of the people competing for it. Um, there was a period, if you look at my amp wiki, there was actually a period for about <laughs> five years where I withdrew from all tournaments and just reeved them because the quality of reeving, everyone was complaining about the quality of I don't, reeving. I don't know that at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> we haven't done whole episodes. <laughs> so I, I literally withdrew from all tournaments and just reeved for about five years. You know, and then I watched Goldwyn. I, I was reaving while Goldwyn's getting a sword belt and while Zeb's getting his sword belt. Like yeah, that I'm was reaving. against me. <laughs> yeah. Goldwyn was. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, in fact, like when Zeb got his warlord, he came up to me and was like upset because I wasn't fighting in those tournaments, but I was reaving them. But because um, and then eventually I was like, you know what? Like, I want to win some tournaments, too. <laughs> so yeah. I started fighting again. Man, it's it's so hard to to balance that like wanting to fight and then trying to make sure you have quality reeves because they are important uh, kind of deal. And I think we just do a bad job of like training reeves is the problem, like as a game as a whole, not necessarily us per se, you know. But it's just it's an odd problem that we have. I feel like. Well, it is an odd problem because you have. I mean, to be a really great reeve, you have to be a decent mm-hmm. fighter, and so yeah, and. Most, you know, we have this weird thing where like people become warlord and they want to just continue to then suppress the competition. So they're not reaving. They're there <laughs> being the tough guy in the field. Everyone else trying to prove themselves is on the field. So who's, who's left to reave? Right. right. So it, it takes like a fighter who's a little sick that day or, or whatnot <laughs> to, you know, to do it. Um, I mean, one of my second place wins, I withdrew from the tournament to go judge an ANS tournament that started because I was a serpent knight. Mm-hmm. And I ended up placing second place. Like, Maybe I'd be a warlord if I didn't do that. Right. Yeah, you're over here putting down threes and fives, and like they come tell you, like, hey, by the way, you took second place. Like, dope, cool. Well, yeah. or and, <laughs> and we've talked about this on the channel before, but I think I was there that event to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> we've talked about this on the channel before, but sword is in a weird place in Epgard culture because you're never really asked to defend your serpent belt, or, or maybe a better way to put this is. There aren't rules that say if there's not sufficient serpent competition, the the next person can't get their order, right? Where with sword, we do have rules, not in uh, Kingdom's Kapora, but in our rules of play, in the rules that all of us have to follow, that specifically say things like sufficient competition is a thing, and it has to be there in order for you to uh, get your belt. As tough as it is for people that, uh, for the people that are trying to come up and beat these sword uh, knights, depending on how your kingdom rules, they may have to be in the tournament in order for whoever is in monarchy to consider giving out one of those high level orders like a tenth. I'm I'm not a big fan of that, but that is the culture that we're currently living in. Couldn't the, well breaking away from I think breaking away from maybe yeah. Well, I was gonna say couldn't like you know a, a standing warlord decides to reeve because they consider that their obligation. Couldn't the monarchy ask that warlord who reaved if the fighting was justifiably worth awarding this next tier of award? Like, when we're using the, when we're making the quality control argument, it feels like the quality control is still there. They're just observing instead of actively fighting, right? I mean, my take on that would be yes. What's your, what would be your opinion of something like that? Let's say that you get your sword belt tomorrow. Um, do you think that as a Reeve, you would be able to accurately qualify fighters in the same way that you would if you had been fighting in the tournament? So I think absolutely, but there's also nothing saying that if I was Reaving a tournament in Flo and I saw you win and I knew a monarch was going to ask me as maybe the only active warlord, if I, let's say I'm the only active warlord, sure. I could spar with you and yeah, then that's give true. my opinion. Like he won the tournament and he's also my peer. Yeah. And yeah. there's no reason, there's no need for me to be in the tournament and suppress you. This is my point of view. And let me just say for the record, I hate our current system of <laughs> tournament I, warlords. I, I guess when you use the, absolutely hate it. I mm-hmm. guess when you use the suppression language that it wasn't one of your favorites. <laughs> let me, let me I wouldn't way. use when, suppression as the term. You know, I like when you, you know. have, <clears throat> when you have fighters who are truly that like God tier, and I'm, I am not saying I'm one of those people, but when you have fighters who are like, for a time and never when her Golan was. Right. I was going to say, we've gotten the privilege, I will call it a privilege, to see some of those people that are 
that were truly meant to be warlords. Right. Like Peter the Quick, I think he's one of the greatest fighters I've ever fought. Like, yep. I would never be in the same category as him, right? And I'm sure he, if he wanted to, could suppress every kingdom tournament in his kingdom if he wanted to, yep. just like Golwyn did for our kingdom. Here's my point, though. To be a sword knight, you don't. We're not the Highlanders. There's not only one. And when you have a <laughs> god tier fighter, th- it doesn't mean that you only have one sword knight in your kingdom. And unfortunately for Neverwinter, that's what that meant for like 15 years because Golwyn yep. was good enough to suppress us all. If I'm if I am historically for 20 years within the top five best fighters in my kingdom, mm-hmm. and I'm not a sword knight, that's a problem. It's an absolute problem. Yeah, right. I'm one of the founders of like one of the largest fighting companies in the Southeast. I can kick the crap out of half the people in my fighting company in any given day, but I'm, I'm not a sword knight because Golwin has always been God tier to me. Yeah, I, I mean, like, it, I guess it comes down to like, what do we want to say that this belt is for, right? Like, I, I personally, not having a sword belt, believe it's like growing fighting in the game, making better fighters all around. And if that's the goal, and it's not just making the best fighters stop then we're kind of going at it the wrong way. Well, and we talked about a li- this a little bit when we had Sir Golan on, and uh, we had a disagreement with, uh, with him. His but cold, dead hand. Yeah, he, <laughs> he, his mentality is, if you want to be the best, you have to beat the best. And I hope that I'm not misrepresenting his position there. Um, I believe that your sword knight should represent a percentage <clears throat> of the top fighters in your kingdom. I don't... I could become a sword knight tomorrow, and that is not saying that I am as good or better than Zeb, than Sir Gillen. I am not. I, it's not saying that I am as good or better than Sir Gunn, because I am not. It's an acknowledgement that I am part of a percentage, which we can discuss what that should be, mm-hmm. of some of the best fighters in this hypothetical that I'm making, right? That's my feeling on how Sword Knight should be represented, which is why I agreed with part of well, what you said there. I, I was going to say, I agree with you in concept, but the problem, I guess, that comes up is, like, without doing, like, Darian suggested, the, the sparring and saying, hey, you know, as a warlord, this guy's of the level kind of deal or something like that, which I never really thought of doing. I think that's a really great idea, to be yeah. honest. Um came the like the the like you had led to the quality control aspect of like are you beating people that makes it worth getting the next order or getting to warlord and things like that and to a certain degree i i agree with it but it becomes a problem like winter's edge is a new kingdom right right or newer kingdom now and we didn't have if we didn't have zeb who had traveled everywhere and then got his belt through a different kingdom because we weren't a kingdom at the time, Mm -hmm. we would start out with zero sword knights, right? So how do we get up there? And Yeah, do you have to wait for a sword knight from another kingdom? And at one one point, there was someone who suggested that the kingdom front the money for a plane ticket from a sword knight to bring them in to bring the quality of the tournament there if they wanted to prove it. And that's kind of the weird thing that sword sword belts and knight and everything where some of the toxic culture kind of stuff comes from i feel like is that at one point sword belt was no longer a kingdom thing it was a national thing at least that was the idea of it and that's what i think we're starting to stray from and i think we're starting to correct ourselves that way it was part of the turn early tournament restructure v7 to v8 sort of thing that we we redefined how we wanted to look at that specific belt in a way that in some ways i i I think that there was some good intentions behind it, but I think that the execution didn't work out exactly as uh, as they well, wanted. Well, on paper, I think it's fine. It's just the culture behind it that is kind of sort of the Can issue. Can I throw out what I would love to see it be? Oh, please, yeah. yeah. Please. Interrupt so. us. Have you watched the show? <laughs> <laughs> Can I say something? Yeah. Um, so I've always thought that the four tournament win standard was just a bad standard. It's toxic. Uh, It's created a toxic environment. I think the three tournament wins is only like a one step in the right direction, but I still think it's like clinging on to just a bad system. What I would love to see it be is, you know, in addition to your streaking and whatever other odd things you might do to stack up or your battlefield prowess up to a certain level, Mm -hmm. I would love to just see a flat objective. Your placement in in a major kingdom tournament is inverse to the order of the warrior you can receive for that. So if you show up and you place 10th, you can be a noob, right? Uh, if you place 10th, then you might get your first order of the warrior, mm-hmm. right? You place ninth, you might get your second. 
so that that you can climb a ladder uh, and you have to you can't skip so you would have to still climb the ladder but a second place would be a ninth and a one first place could then be your tenth but guess what like if you've climbed that ladder and you've gotten sequentially a sixth seventh eighth ninth and tenth that means you've placed first second third fourth fifth that's not an accident. You're one of the best fighters in your kingdom. Yeah. You should be a sword knight. Right. I actually really, really like that because I've seen, I think I've seen you post that a couple of times. I wrote it and I sent, like every time there was like feedback to any committee, I sent it everywhere, but I feel like it just like keeps going into the void, but mm-hmm. I'm here now, so I can say <laughs> it. You've heard of yeah. Eighth Guard committees before. Good. Good. <laughs> we know how they work. <laughs> Moving off of the, the sword belt thing too and talking about other things that you've wrote. I will not written. I will written, wrote, <laughs> written, ridded. I was going to die if I didn't right. say something. I graduated from public school in Tennessee. The, <laughs> I, I, I won't go so far as to credit you with the originator of this idea, but I know that long, long before the battle night became a thing that it was actually in there, you wrote up something that was kind of similar for having a, a, a belt for... Uh, battle games. Again, I'm sure that there have been many, many people over the lifetime of Amp Guard that have done this, but you actually put pen to paper, or in this case, keyboard to fingers, <laughs> and 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 put something together. And I was talking about this with some other people that saw what you had put together, and what we ended up with is eerily similar to what you had originally written. Written, wrote it. So I, I was not involved in like the Scribe. battle night committee. Okay, that was what I was going to ask. But, but yeah, I did years ago. And actually, I, I looked it up recently because it was almost five years ago. I started a night five committee and I pulled in people from multiple different kingdoms. And we talked about what a good criteria would be. And we wrote up a criteria. And at the time, we suggested that it either be called um, uh, Knight of the Helm instead of Sword. And that instead of battle master, it be general. So you can be a general and and get an order of the helm, or you could be a warlord and get an order of the sword. But the yeah, you're right. The criteria is eerily similar. And I did, I broadcast what we wrote everywhere I could. And every time somebody on one of the many thousands of Amgard threads <laughs> saying we need a battle night, I would post the link. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'd like to I'd like to think somewhere whether through osmosis or intent that it was like read and worked off of by me, but I have no idea if it was. Yeah. Just a, just a cool point to make that, uh, those ideas that you have that no matter how, you know, off cuff or small or whatever they might seem, what Darian did here is the way that you get those out, right? Pull other people in, some that you think will agree or disagree with you, make the idea better, and then start putting it out there. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm not... There was a lot of people that made Battle Night happen. I'm not saying that you're the originator, but there's some influence we'll there, definitely. <laughs> I say that there is. Okay. Uh, I'll and and, and since I'm the only one that matters... No, I'm kidding. Now, hold we, on just We, we did start the hashtag <laughs> Night 5. For whatever that's worth. Okay, yeah. That's actually really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's more fighting stuff I want to talk about, but just real quick, I want to throw this out there and then sure. just, again, yuck it into the void. I I want, for for Sword Knights, I want Griffin to play some kind of role in getting that belt. It used to. Yeah. Well, okay, it used to in some kingdoms. Yeah. Yeah, it never, it never like officially did, but it was sort of, I don't know, I just, Griffin is a cool award and it, it ties directly in with what Sword Knights do or, or should be doing, I guess when it comes to like honor on the battlefield and that kind of thing. And I think it's a, like personally, if I was a, you know, getting to the point of sword knight and I didn't have any Griffins, I'd want to fix that. Not like if my kingdom's not giving them out, right? Like that's a whole separate issue, but like, I want to be seen as a very honorable fighter. Like, you know, we can all talk about like, uh, sir, sir Gillen, right? Like, I have never questioned when that guy calls something that it's one what of the it's most honorable to be. people that I've ever met. I've seen him take stuff that I'm like, you shouldn't take that. And he's like, nope, I'm going to take it. It's got to be clean. I've got to be, you know, beyond reproach or whatever. Uh, we're doing fine on time. Okay. Um, we're still working off. I don't know when, like, we consistency have two and wise, a half hours, I this will come out, but our video, our, our card is still on low space. So yeah, I wanted yeah. to make sure we were good. Um, but, but, like, you know, Zeb himself has said you know, that he wants to be beyond reproach with all of his calls and everything else, and that sort of sits right in that Griffin territory. I mean, there's more to it than just that, but, like, it's certainly a thing that I feel like Sword Knights should be chasing as well if it only mattered to that belt. Um, but I want to pivot from that because that's sort of just a... We can waffle on that forever. Um, you actually... Um, we were talking about this on the ride over. We were talking about, like, footage and fighting and how footage is often not 
worth a damn in most cases. Um, and, you know, we kind of talking about like TikTok and everything else. You actually at one point had the number, or I, I guess you still do because eSAM doesn't do anything anymore, the number five eSAM thread of all time. <laughs> um, I actually tried to pull it up because that I would was get gonna, you your fifth it, order. It's like locked. You have to have a login, and I even tried to reset my log because it's funny. I tried to reset my login, and we need Sir Randall to pull it out of the archives. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how we do that. I can probably hit him up, but I mean, yeah. who knows? You know what he's got time for? But the premise of that thread, if I remember it correctly, was talking about videoed fights and how they're not always super useful. So, like, give us your take on that. Yeah, so I think, I mean, when that happened, that was like 1999, 2000, like video footage sucked. Oh, yeah, so the guy had to be there with the camera turning the crank. <laughs> well, it was actually a TV <laughs> film crew, so it was actually God. decent video, but even for the time, you know, it, it still sort of sucked. Um, but, yeah, I, I, you know, I watch every fight video that I see, and I, the people I don't know, you know, I watch all the Come Try LARP stuff, I watch... Mm-hmm. Any, I watch all of Dallas' stuff. Um, mm-hmm. I watch it all, and I try the best I can to just absorb it all. But I honestly, you know, from watching thousands of hours of fight footage, I don't think it tells you squat. You know, and without without the two combatants and the Reeve, like, communicating some result, I don't think video is good for anything other than observing footwork and moves and openers and counters. Like, you can learn all that, but in terms of, like, who won. Who's actually hitting and who's win? It doesn't tell you crap. Well, I mean, there, there are, like, to, to piggyback off that, there's a lot of Come Try LARP videos on their TikTok where it's like they'll show a fight and then they'll show the fight again with, with Hogman doing commentary saying, like, well, here's what happened and these two players agreed that this is what happened. So whatever you saw is not necessarily what they agreed on. Like, you have to understand they're fighting, you know, they have different angles than you and everything else. And so it's it's one of those things that we regularly see whether or not it's being you know, pointed out in this way. Right. I mean, I, I, at one point I even was a little concerned about it because video is becoming prevalent and especially like, you know, all the, all the people chasing a sword belt, they're all out there videoing everything and they're posting it everywhere. And a lot of people, you know, I, I sort of fear are, they post their good fights and they don't post their bad fights. And it's sort of like part of like pumping themselves up when they post the other guy's <clears throat> bad fights, right, right. And they post the other guy's yeah. bad fights. So yeah, I even, and you know, I know that he who should not be named, I reached out to him one time and I said, I'm concerned about like how video video footage is being used to like justify or deny orders of the warrior or sword belts. Mm-hmm. And I suggested that we standardize hand communications when fights end in any videoed fight. So, yep. you know, actually calling dad or, you know, or, or pointing out your shots. Flo I mean, has made a point of this before, but I think for the reaving side of things. Well, yeah. Oh, even the fight. I mean, if we were to standardize it, like I know our tournament fight is being videoed. We can take the two seconds and we can both turn and I can point, you know, arm chest and you can point like, you know, like arm block or whatever. And you can communicate it and everyone watching it would know that's what happened. And I think it'd be a better teaching tool because we could we could then understand the sequencing if mm-hmm. we understood what hits actually landed and what was blocked. Well, and I think part of the problem, Jeff was just about to say exactly what I'm going to say, I'd be willing to lay money on it, is that these videos aren't being put together as teaching tools, though we are looking at them as teaching tools. Right? Actually, no, it's the... Get in the drift, buddy. Yeah, uh, uh, the verbiage and, and stuff. Jeff and I are never in the drift. <laughs> um, well, I, I 100% agree with you, right? The problem is, it is uh, or it's, it's easier with the, the physical showing of like a sign language type thing, effectively. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, for people watching at home Teflon's or on, on here. YouTube. Yeah, Teflon's here. I I asked him many times to get in the shot and he just won't scoot down. So he's kind of the neighbor from Home Improvement uh, of this podcast. <laughs> plus, plus with two bald heads on shot, it's like really shiny. Dude, yeah, so. I'm just trying to keep we don't the, even the have lighting the better. The light turned on. <laughs> oh yeah, it's just shining off. <laughs> uh, I'm well every, now and then, every now and then the mouse will move and like this monitor turns on and it's just like shing like right off the top of your dome. <laughs> but it, it's the, the verbiage that we use when talking to each other about fights is that it's regional and many times and it may, no, and that, yeah, right. And that regionality may be parks at that point too. Right. So we're the, calling good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. If, if you even know or good, like who are you talking? Are you talking about my shot, your shot, right. what's going on there? But with, again, with your, your, to your point is that the sign language of it is better overall. So 
it's really interesting to you. Yeah, I know. I know not everybody's going to do it, but if you took like your top fighters and we said, "Hey, we're all going to just agree that we know there's a camera there and it's a weapon master tournament, but let's just all face the camera and point out what's happening because mm-hmm. it'll be better for everybody." Right. If we all got in the habit of doing that, I think every video would would become inherently. Well, I, I mean, again, to your point, to to videos potentially bad at least for like um, people's name or whatever, right? Uh, there's one video that the contri- come trial art guys put up that shows one direction and then they take the footage from the other side of it and it looks pretty different. Yeah. So again, oh, I saw that because I did not re- until I think you or maybe until Zeb pointed it out. Um, I thought they were two different fights. Oh no, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's it, like, no. And then they showed it from the other angle and I'm like, huh? I think Ooh. the, I, again, I'm speaking for Hogman here. So, Hogman, if you're listening, please correct me in the comments here. I think one of the reasons they did that was to portray how different a fight can look for the Reeves when you're looking at one side versus the other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's why a lot of times I think even good Reeves are hesitant to make a call sometimes because you don't want to say that, hey, you're cheating um, and because that's how it's going to feel, right? Right. Um, but... It's also, you know, with good reaving, you know, for me at least, I have a lot of auditory cues and stuff like that that I try to use with it. But um, it's just very difficult to to see what's in the melee of what's happening because you can't keep track of swords completely. Yeah. Not to a level that you can say, oh, that's, you know, that's your wrist line or it's a forearm uh, potentially, you know. Yeah. And especially with video, like there's always a little bit of audio latency. And yeah. that screws up. Audio, yeah, audio latency. It's catching the bend in the sword, which may project on a two-dimensional look. Not great for the fighter when he's straight blocked it. So, As the person who has to edit the audio and video for this and still never gets it perfect, yeah, there's a lot of audio latency. It's <laughs> We're just talking. We're yeah. not fighting. We're, We're not doing audible popping. Well, but see, this doodad records it at uh, 3,200 kilohertz, and this is at... 60 frames a second and when you mesh those together it's a nightmare it's a hellscape (laughs) we actually have talked before uh i don't know if we've brought this up on the podcast before but there was a fight that went to the radiant valley tiktok which if you're not subscribed please subscribe to the radiant valley tiktok (laughs) um right after you hit the like button smash uh uh, subscribe and do whatever else i'm supposed to tell you to do remember to do this because i don't the uh that was between teflon and sir gillen it was at our fighter practice um, and if you look at it at different points, it looks like either one of them like doesn't call a shot. And yet they both keep laughing and talking to each other because all of us that were standing in that pavilion knew that everybody, that the fight was totally clean, that everyone had called what they were supposed to. But if you, you know, Teflon going back and looking at the video, he's like, it looks like I blew a shot right here. Like, I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the, the spin and counter spin. The only uh, thing worse than one. reviewing other people's fight footage is reviewing your own. <laughs> but it's You're just, like, did I do that? Yeah, it's just to really emphasize what you've been saying here, though, that video can be a useful tool for certain things, but it is not our Rosetta Stone uh, for fighting. I've got, I know that the Rosetta Stone was a bad thing there. Yeah, if no, you, go ahead. If you talk as <laughs> much as, say anything. if you talk as much as I do, some percentage of what you say is just going to be deeply I'm stupid. I'm not even facing the camera. They couldn't <laughs> see me do the eyebrow thing. <laughs> but um, there is, uh, the, the video can be really useful for us. There's a lot that you can get from it. I've learned quite a bit from watching, especially the ones that were meant to be teaching tools. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Sir Tato, um, doing some of his teaching, other great teachers that we've had in the game that have made videos sp- expressly for that. But watching just the fighting and then saying, not doing it to watch footwork or something, but saying who won, I agree with Darian completely. It's not the best tool there. Well, so as as the only person in the room who can probably remember that, that ESAM thread with any resolution. I legit tried to log in yeah, just yeah, a minute ago and couldn't remember and it. Like, yeah. yeah. Uh, what was the consensus when you when you posted that way back when? Like It was a great, great social experiment for its time because I was immediately called out as a sluffer by like some of the best fighters in the game. Right. But <laughs> I then, hate to say I could have guessed that, but I, I could have. But then there were other people who said hero because uh, the... The video footage was, you know, it was like a 30 second clip that a news crew filmed. And you got to remember at my park at the time, there's like, 
like a, a bunch of like newer fighters and they basically were just like, you know, ninja fighting me one on one. And I was just like killing them all. And it, <laughs> it was also at the time, never when it was atomic clock. So you also had to understand that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But for the uh, pause for just a moment for the listeners <laughs> that may not know what atomic clock is, which this is really a thing because we don't do it anymore. Atomic clock was a fighting system that we used where the first person to hit was an in, insta kill on that whatever they hit and nothing else counted I mean, so it's almost like modern fencing right where like as soon as you close that circuit it lights up and that's it and yeah it doesn't matter what happened after that so it was even more prone to things looking bad because you would hit someone and then keep going after they've hit you but none of their stuff counted yeah. sorry go ahead so at the time like a lot of the best known fighters in the game were like lambasting me as a total sluffer and that went on and then some people were like defending me and then I, one of them actually, and I can't remember, I can't remember who was championing me and who wasn't, so I'm leaving all names out on purpose. Sure. But one of them, it was like one of the most respected fighters at the time, was like, I slowed down the video and he's clearly sloughing, whatever. And then one of the other like notable fighters at the time actually slowed down the video and posted it <laughs> and proved that every shot was clean. So while the poll by and large called me a sluffer like i was later vindicated within the text that's really cool (laughs) but it's weird that all of that happened yeah totally weird especially (laughs) because the context of it was hey guys a news crew came out and filmed this really great thing this is awesome for amcard and all amcard took from it was darian's a sluffer or hero (laughs) question mark poll Wow. That sounds like the most <laughs> internet thing ever. Yeah. It sounds like the most amp guard thing ever. Because like, <laughs> it actually was a really good news promo. Yeah, really those are so was. rare. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. yeah. And I was so happy because at that point in my amp guard experience, I had experienced multiple really bad news promos you know, where they fake like they're interested and then all they we do had is make a hit fun of you. We here in Knoxville. Have we right? did. Mm-hmm. Knoxville's yeah. biggest nerds. Yeah. Right, right. So, you still have one of those? I think I have that newspaper. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sitting yeah. Right excellent. Up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this news crew actually came out and, you know, did the thing where they said they were interested and we thought they were going to, like, lambast us. And then they put out a really just awesome piece that was That's a great really promotional cool. tool for us. So I was, like, so happy. And I posted on East saying, like, look, guys, we actually got some good exposure. And all they did was, like, crucify me. <laughs> Can't you guys just enjoy anything? <laughs> just for a minute. Why we can't have nice things. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I mean. No, it's just, it's an interesting thing that, like, I, I saw number five ESAM thread of all time, and I had to chase it down, and I got as far as I could. I'm, I'm proud of it now. At the time, you yeah. know, it wasn't fun. But Yeah. So there was another thing. Hold on. I, I'm, I think I'm still logged in on ESAM, so Flo, if you have a thing, go. I got to get back to the wiki, because there was a thing I saw here that was really cool. I actually wanted to, we talked about this just a little bit before we came on air, uh, and this is in your Amped Wiki. Okay, uh, you are going to say what I was going to say. Okay. It says that you are uh, a named character, <laughs> Captain Darian, in the 2012 Nintendo 3DS game titled Heroes of Ruin. Tell me the story about Unrelated that. to the E. Sam Sluffer. Right <laughs> yeah, we're, we're completely changing direction. <laughs> so uh, one of the Blue Moose, uh, his name is Almasi Marquis, um, great amp garter. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't play anymore, but um, he was just fantastic flavor for our game. I loved Almasi. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was also the creator of the uh, Keldrick fan page, if you ever saw that. He got a dra- I vaguely he got remember this. That. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so he... Um, he he was the person who created Flurb, the RPG, which we can get to next. Yeah. But he, in his professional career, became a video game designer, mm-hmm. and he ended up being the um, lead director for all the 3DS Star Wars games. And I had begged him and begged him and begged him, like, <laughs> you have to make me a Star Wars character. <laughs> so he actually, in every game, submitted a Darien Star Rock Star Wars, like, to be canonized into Star Wars. So and good. Lucasfilm rejected me every time because they didn't like the name. Like they didn't know I was a real person. Like they just didn't like the name. So the Plo Koon is fine, I guess. <laughs> so, Whatever. Yeah. I mean, we have Jar Jar Binks, but Darian Stark got affirmatively rejected or three times. Poe um, Dameron, because yeah, that's totally like, I like different. Po. I, no, I'm not saying Poe. that Poe's a bad character yeah. or names. anything, but the names are similar enough that they should have been. <laughs> so after doing his duty and attempting to get me canonized in Star Wars multiple times, uh, he became the director on the Heroes of Ruin project and he put me in that finally to throw me a bone. So I am the sea captain Darren Starrock that you you buy passage from back and forth in the game. 
But then, uh, in true Almasi fashion, I get eaten by a kraken at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Spoilers for people who haven't played the yeah. 2012. So, <laughs> kind of funny story with it, too, is that a whole bunch of us back in the day played a game called X Steel. And oh, yeah. yeah, so I was Teflon Triad on it at the time, and I'm playing, and I don't think I had headphones or nothing really at the time or anything playing. And then all of a sudden, I see Keldrick Seraphim and Darian Seraphim, and there was another person. I don't remember who it was, but I, I you remember. You and I were on. I, we're, yeah. No, I was by myself because I was playing uh, uh, at MTSU. I played with uh, I played with you when they were in there too. Oh, we were you? doing rifles. Okay, jump, maybe fire, so. Jump, fire, jump, uh, fire. And we, you know, we formed a, a a room or whatever it was. I don't remember. Uh, and we're talking a little bit. And at one point, because this is whenever this was when I first went there, and the internet was absolute garbage. And like we were talking and doing stuff, and then like. I immediately disconnected. I'm like, well, I'll never find them again. <laughs> that was your one chance. That yeah. Do it. Oh, that game was dumb fun. Now I just want to play XT. I know, right? Oh. Actually, Flo, I think you were a part of me quitting first first person shooters forever. You remember when we were at Goldwyn's house and we were playing Halo? No. Uh, we were playing, <laughs> we were playing Halo on a big, like, giant projection television, and my brother was there. And we, we were playing rounds of Halo. It was at Goldwyn's house. This is like circa like 2000, 2001. And, um, oh, this know, would have been Halo 1. Yeah, it's Halo 1. When the rocket and, launcher uh, was good. <laughs> and no joke, and like, I, I got some version of a you know snipe scoped rifle. And I, I found like this perch. And I was like hunting for people to shoot. And then I hear my brother go, seriously, guys? And we both look up. And Flo and I were back to back. <laughs> Both with scope right, and my brother goes pop pop and kills his bone. <laughs> and I was like, "That's it, I am done with first position." I am classically bad at video games. Bullshit. We bullshit. We were literally back to back. Didn't know each other was there. My brother just pop pop. It's the perfect place. <laughs> when I was this guy's roommate for a while, we played TF2 competitively. And I saw this dude do stuff with a flamethrower that I didn't know you could do in TF2. <laughs> I didn't know you could bounce rockets back that well. I didn't know you could time it just right and get all of the engineer rockets to bounce back in one go. Oh, yeah, that's fun. Yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> so, so you're not good at video games. You're good at at least one. Yeah. I, I, was, I, I was a ranked uh, pyro in TF2. I don't worry. It's dead now, so. I know. <laughs> it's just bots. So how do you get the name Darien, though? Is that just something you picked, or is this uh, like a given name, or how does that show up? So I actually just picked that because that was one of my... The, again, the people that I started playing Emker with, we also would a lot of times play D&D at the scout camp. Yeah. And Darien was just one of... It was a dwarf character, but it was one of my main characters that I played. Okay. I wonder how many people's persona it's name... Be. A high percentage is some part of a D and D character campaign. Yeah, at least for a certain generation. Yeah, Maybe not everybody, but man, I don't know. Like D and D secretly has always been really big, as it turns out. And only now that you know, again, pre-internet, nobody. But like now that the internet's around, D and D's huge. Yeah, yeah, it's everywhere. So you had a um, you just, you just sort of picked your name and it worked out, which is exceedingly rare. It seems like at least in our areas. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> trying to pick your own name here is a death sentence. You're getting cabbage or something like, <laughs> you know you're getting something goofy so that's i'm glad that worked out for you not that i'm bitter I'm not. um you had a funny story for how you got the second name do you want to tell that on air or no I, I can i okay. can't so like like Flo, my real amp guard name is something much longer and flurbier it's still darian <laughs> but there's I, I literally at the time made it to be like the longest name anyone's ever heard of. So it's very long. And, and then along came Regan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I, I'm not even talking titles. I'm talking like just the name okay. <laughs> is, <laughs> is long and ridiculous. Um, and so that was my name basically until I went to college and started Lost Woods. And, um, and then at some point I was dating a young lady and her last name was Starruck, right. and she eventually broke up with me in part because I was too nerdy doing this thing. And I said, that's cool. I'm turning your name into my nerdy name it's thing. That's so good. So, that's so, I, so I changed my name slightly out of spite, but it's actually a cool name. So <laughs> yeah. it's, it's fantastic. It's been my name ever since. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's actually someone's real revenge, name right? that I stole. Like, I don't know if revenge is the right word. So I, like it is. I know that you have uh, some stories 
for sure. us. You've been in the game for a long time. Um, <laughs> what? Oh, <laughs> do you do have phone notes? The phone. The oh, phone man, that's good. <laughs> we have a list. That's, what, that's like when the pin clicks at the job interview. <laughs> You're like, oh, no. The... Uh, uh, so there's some portion of them that we want uh, to do, but I actually didn't work this out with Holy any of- crap. Okay, yeah. I know it can't be seen necessarily, but <laughs> I, I just saw like a glimpse of it. It's a huge I have list. options. It's <laughs> so good. I, I, didn't work the, I didn't discuss this with either of the other guys, but like most things, we beta test while on air. Um, <laughs> I want you to tell some of the stories, and then um, we are going to do another recording after this where you tell some of the other stories and maybe that just goes up for our Patreon? I'm off tomorrow. Let's do it. Okay. Cool. Sure. What do you think would be the most fun for everyone that's not on Patreon to hear? You should subscribe <laughs> to our Patreon. It just went up. I'll, I'll pitch it at the end here, but yeah, we did just, just start yeah, I guess we need a new outro, huh? Oh, God. <laughs> you know how long it took me to make the, just the theme music for the D&D podcast? No. Hours. Forever. I'm bad at making music. <laughs> so why don't you tell the pole arm story and then I'll tell one. And the then we'll... uh, you, you, there? no, no, no. You can't deconstruct that right now. It, it will be dangerous. But you can, you can kind of see the little, uh, the white right there. Those are actually sound panels, um, that are in place in tension, and and <clears throat> Cabbage is going to drop them on his head. But a long time ago, um, we were at an event, and I had gotten very sick. Uh, at this event. Uh, I can't remember what happened or why, but it was flu-like conditions. I was running a really high fever. The medocrat there was like, hey, if this fever doesn't start dropping, we're going to take you to the hospital. And I said, oh, I don't want to have to pay for the hospital. And then he just smiled and patted my arm and left. <laughs> um, and Darian comes by. I think that... I think that you were in the triads at this time. Both yeah. of us were in the triads. Um, Darian comes by one of the last days and says, Hey, bud. Uh, it may be the other pole arm. God damn it. The, <laughs> Darian comes by the last day and, and does the, the normal friend thing. Like, hey, man, I just wanted to check on you. Do you need anything to drink or something like that? Is there anything I can do to help? And I said, yes. Could you sign something for me? And he said, yeah, I can absolutely do that. So he goes and finds this broken pole arm core, which is somewhere back there. Does it have this wrapper? Oh, yeah, it does. Okay. That is actually, that it's a blue moose stamp on the bottom of it. <laughs> it is. Yeah. You're probably, I mean, you might not be able to see it on camera, but. Yep, blue yeah. moose stamp on the bottom of it. And he said, yeah, I can do that oh, for you, it, bud. It's actually one of my pommels. It says yeah. Darian Stark, Dark Water East. This is one of <laughs> That's Dark awesome. Water East. Yeah. And. <laughs> He comes back, he comes back with a pin and sets down by my bed and said, who am I making it out to? <laughs> and then he signs it. Um, oh, I like how you've used it as like a banner pole for a triad thing. That's the it's original the, triad flag. Yeah. Golly. So it, it says here, to flow, my greatest fan, <laughs> Darian. It's dated. 2 Oh, man. <laughs> wow. Let me get some pictures to go up on the... <laughs> Cool. <laughs> so yeah uh that was uh we had known each other for i guess four or five years uh, at that point and uh, that was one of the cool things that came out of me running a fever and probably getting you sick <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome i i had forgotten that it was actually one of my pommels that's awesome <laughs> and i want to hold this up too the uh, uh, this is actually we were talking about the triads uh, earlier. This is actually the original triad flag, and uh, I'm going to do this. Actually, could you hold this mic for a sec? There you go. Well, you got to put the banner back. For, you gotta... Let me stand up. I actually prefer that symbol over the the. Yeah, this is this is pre Valnet. I didn't know you had it, a symbol. It always looked like Klingon to me. Oh well, yeah, I always thought crow feet or something. I <laughs> I liked it because I thought that it looked like Norse runes or something. But um, my my understanding of the story why this didn't stay our symbol is, Goan said Goan <clears throat> Goan made this, and then said, "Who are you going to get to continue sewing these? Because I will never sew one again." <laughs> and the Valnet was easier. Uh, apparently, I like sewing the Valnet. It was fun. It I mean, was it's a cool looking symbol. Don't it, get me wrong. It just it's looks because way you can actually do it as one continuous thing. You sew down through here and oh, then sew across. Okay. The the way that it's built, you never have to 
uh, completely, you can leave the needle in and just turn it okay. and keep going. Okay. So, so All right. All right. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> so I do have a list of stories, but I think for the, the general populace, I think I'd like to share what I think is probably one of the greatest trolling moments in Amp Garden oh, history. This yes. sounds great. This is okay. perfect. <laughs> so, this is also from the ESAM days. And um, this is probably, this is um, before even Lost Woods had become a very healthy barony. We, we probably had like eight, nine players. And um, we, we were in Tallahassee, Florida. And again, like internet was like barely a thing. Like we had ESAM. There's no Facebook or any of that yet. And we were all just a bunch of poor college students. And we knew that there were parks. There was a park in Valdosta that we knew of. And there was a park out in the Panhandle that we knew of, which was in Panama City or Fort Walton Beach. That's uh, where uh, Sir Kudzu's park was in, mm-hmm. in 12. Um, but we hadn't really met them yet. And they were, you know, that, <laughs> that's like a two and a half hour drive. But we were the poor college students. And we thought, like, it'd be great if we could get some of these parks to visit us. Um, but you know, we don't really have the resources to go visit them, but it would be really great if they come visit us. <laughs> and, uh, do you remember Charlie Brown? I do. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, so Charlie Brown just goes, Oh, don't worry guys. I got it. And, like he doesn't share any of this with any of us. Like I, I read all of this after the event at the end happened. Like, okay. <laughs> oh, like, wow, okay. Okay. So I had no idea. This is how he accomplished the event at the end of this story. He goes on to the fighter, this is by himself without discussion with anybody. He goes on to the like fighters section of ESAM. If you remember, they had like yeah. rules, general, like fighters. Mm-hmm. He goes on fighters and he just posts just a single thread of, um, hey guys, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on my way to becoming a warlord. I would really, <laughs> really appreciate some, some help, some technique, uh, help in my chosen weapon. Um, you know, and some people in my kingdom like told me I should really work on my single sword, but, um, but you know, the best fighter at my park says like bow staff is where it's at. Oh, and so, um, okay. I actually I, remember, I'd really this, appreciate some like. help with the bow staff. And of course, you know, the, the conversation now turns to trying to convince this young chap from away from the bow staff <laughs> and back towards the single sword. Um, and then like through that discussion he like manipulates that like them into thinking he misunderstood their instruction and that um okay he was switching to flail from (laughs) from the from the quarter staff and you know and they're all like no that's not what we were saying at all like it needs to be like single sword it's order board um and then he goes on to say like well you know one of the greatest fighters in the game is is at my park and he's really saying it should be the flail and um so these people are like, wait, wait, you're saying now one of the greatest fighters of the game is at your part? Like, what are you talking about? He's like, oh, I have some video. And you all will remember the lightning bolt video. Yeah. At, oh, yeah. At this time, the lightning bolt video is like newly in the internet, right? <laughs> Nobody really knew where it came from. <laughs> Nobody really knew what it was. And he's like, yeah, this is our park, Lost Woods. And he drops the lightning bolt video. So everybody's like, you guys are the lightning bolt? Like, <laughs> that's actually, that's not even him, guard. Like, what are you saying? And he's like, yeah, he's like, that's Darian. He's like pretty much the best fighter. Like the guy who's like the reptile, you know? <laughs> and you remember like the reptile guy yeah, and then he gets hit with one of the lightning oh bolts and he like dies at the tree, <laughs> you know? And he's like, he's like, Nemo's in the box. You know? <laughs> and, and so... So these parks that are in our region decide that they're going to learn us um, <laughs> and they all like traveled to invade us like on a certain day so they could teach and like, uh, like Randy Dark Jester and Orlando Dark Jester came like Sir Kudzu, like 12, uh, Sir Leo yep. and, uh, and his squire um, Sanchez, all of them. Oh, that's amazing. On the that's Lost Woods. masterful. Of course, like the Lost Woods were like all people my skill level. So they show up and they declare invasion rules and we fucking romp them, <laughs> which they did not like at all. But it, it formed a really good friendship because they're like, okay, you guys are cool. Like you got us. Like that was, that was That's really cool. funny trolling. Um, and so, and Charlie Brown did it all. And like afterwards I was like, like they all, sh- I didn't even know they were coming. They all just showed up and I was like, what's going on? Charlie Brown's like, I told you I get people here. <laughs> so it was like after we played them, I came back and like read the ESAM and I was like, this is a masterpiece. <laughs> this is so I'm pretty sure that thread gets referenced like throughout ESAM's history because I, I remember 
seeing something about it and searching for that specific thread and reading through it as a young <laughs> Am Carter too. It's as so all Charlie good. Brown and as a Lost Woods. I don't. I never made the connection because I'm dumb. But <laughs> just I mean, the power you can wield with that. Like God, I hope they're using it responsibly now. <laughs> Holy crap! That level of gaslighting. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, dang, that's awesome. <laughs> Do you have one other story that you want to share with with the class? With the class? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, let's see. You had one about fire hardened bamboo, but I don't know if that goes here or later. So it's a long one, and I'm happy to tell it to the general populace, but it is long. But it, it it's probably my favorite story in like all of them. Audience, do you? Oh, no, they they said they have time. Okay, <laughs> okay. Tell us the story, Flo. <laughs> That's not how Grimlock talks. Okay. I... <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm turning them back into a dragon. So he definitely won't talk like that then. What's the story? Okay, so um, this is this is actually it was also this was chronicled on Sam, and again I tried to save it, but it's locked out. But this was chronicled by the bard Green Day, and he chronicled it masterfully. Like if, if again, if, if you actually do talk to Sir Randall and can unlock some of these things, mm-hmm. the chronicle of Tombo's War or Amasi's War, I think it was, um, if he can unlock that, it needs to be preserved and shared. Because uh, Green Day later got some order for writing the chronicle of how this went down. <laughs> That's but, pretty funny. So I'll tell the story because I know you guys are big fans of fire hardened bamboo that came out of the Neverwinter series. So, um, Almasi was a young player at the time and everyone knew that the Sir Tombo fire hardened bamboo was like what you needed for a pole arm. So we go to an event and he buys one of these fire hardened bamboo poles from Sir Tombo and it was a beautiful piece of bamboo and he comes back and he makes himself a pole arm and it was really nice. And, uh, back then Lost Woods had weekly fighter practices so he comes out and he has this beautiful pole arm that he just built. And one of our fighters um, just said something like, you know, what are we supposed to do against the pole arm if we don't have another pole arm? And I, you know, I, and I was like teaching uh, sort of like a class. So that's sort of what I did at the Lost Woods Fighter Practice. And I just said, like, you can take out a pole arm with anything. And someone said, like, oh, you can't like take him out with a single sword or whatever. And I said, sure, sure you can. Like, here, I'll show you. So, um, so I gave. I gave Nemo, and Nemo's a good fighter. I right. gave Nemo the pole arm, and I took a single sword, and I said, okay, Nemo, you know, come at me. So Nemo comes in, and he comes with a hard stab, and I, I blocked it out, like, super hard, and one block cracked in half. Ow! Oh. Just broke it. Oh, no. And then, but, but without stopping to acknowledge it, I then, like, stepped up and, like, killed Nemo. And then I turned to the class, and I said, you just got to make sure the block is firm enough that you crack the pole. <laughs> And then go in for the double tap. And Almasi thought I did this on purpose. So he like starts flipping his crap that I broke his pole. You know, then later I explained to him that it was an accident. I didn't intentionally mean to break his pole. So Almasi then writes Sir Tombo that his pole broke and he would like a replacement. To which Sir Tombo replies, there are no refunds. Uh, no replacements, no refunds, no warranties. Yeah. So then Almasi's like, I would like my ten dollars back, <laughs> and or twenty dollars back, whatever. You know, and Tosha Dabo's like, you know, no warranties, no replacements, no whatever. And um, you know, and Almasi was like flirting it up, like writing like formal demands or there will be consequences, whatever. <laughs> and Sir Tombo just kept like blowing him off. So Sir Tombo at the time was at Darkwater East, which was the biggest park in Neverwinter. They were a grand duchy at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, they were fielding sixty plus weekly. And so we staged an all kingdom invasion on a park day of Darkwater <laughs> East. Every park in the entire kingdom invaded Darkwater East on one day, on one Sunday, over a broken pole arm. <laughs> That's hilarious. So we all rolled up and we, we declared invasion rules. So back then, invasion rules was. Um, you know, there were actually like consequences for invading and losing. Like you got mm-hmm. political control of a park. You could like count them as your numbers or whatever. Mm-hmm. So um, we declared the invasion rules, which meant all invaders got one life. The defenders got full lives. You know, it was full class battle. But we, I mean, we came, everybody came like armor, everything. And Dark Waters didn't know. They just showed up for a park day. And then they <laughs> see like falling fire rolls up. 
And then like Lost Woods rolls up and then like Dragon's Keep and then like Windstorm <laughs> Woods, the entire kingdom. Like, guys, the parking lot's really full today. I don't know why. Oh no. <laughs> so, I mean, this might've been like the single largest battle Neverwinter ever had. Cause it was like every player in the entire Just on like game, a regular park day? On a regular Sunday. God, it wasn't even so a Saturday. Good. It was a oh, Sunday. Wow. Everybody traveled. So, so they show up and everybody gears up for this war. And dark waters on one side, the entire rest of the kingdoms on the other side, and um, we actually had a parlay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, sir, <laughs> so, 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 sir, sir Tombo comes like, and we actually like all did like the you know the coconut riding out, and we had a white flag, and uh, and we come out, and it was like Sir Bjorn and Sir Tombo and Sir Toda, and yep. then like Golwen and Stinkfoot. And myself and all Massey. Stinkfoot in the negotiating party, huh? <laughs> and, <laughs> Bold. And, and so, like, we walk up, and all Massey is like, I'll handle the talking gentleman. <laughs> Smart like, move. Smart move. And he's like, comes up, and he's like, Sir Tombo? <laughs> Sir Tombo's like, uh, you know. I think I think at this point, uh, all Massey was a Marquis. He's like, Mar- Marquis Al Massey. And he's like, um, I would like a replacement. Hold on, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Tom, the entire kingdom's like waiting for the outcome of the conversation. And Sir Tom was like, "There are no replacements, no refunds, no warranties." <laughs> and, and so I'm actually like, "I will give you one last chance to give me my twenty dollars." <laughs> 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 and so Tabo just goes, absolutely not. And so Almasi like takes his gauntlet and like throws it at his feet. And he's like, this means war. <laughs> and like the entire kingdom like blows up. <laughs> so they, we then like proceed to have like a two and a half hour plus battle where we're doing the invasion rules and we're resurrecting and like stakes are high. It actually spills over into the woods, like off of their field, like, <laughs> Like dark water was holed up, and they had they had like this like wooded area where they like you know it was like their second stage keep, <laughs> and like <laughs> and we're invading them there, and I mean it got like really heated, and we actually were eventually uh, like we were uh, going to win most likely, and then they called it off because like people were getting too heated, uh, but oh. um, but I I think it was probably like the single greatest day in Neverwinter history. Awesome. <laughs> it's amazing. It's one of the things that I feel like modern Amp Guard misses. Kayfabe. Is, yeah. It's what Amp Guard needs. It's so true. We even, uh, Kazan was Duke of Darkwater at the time. Oh, yes. And, <laughs> and he actually, um, like a month before, Darkwater visited Lost Woods. And we knew they were coming and they were going to stay at my apartment. So I, I printed up. I went to like Kinko's or Target Copy. And I, I, I had like, I had like a cover a color cover page and it was like never winter battle plan for the dark water invasion east and i had it like spiral bound you know, with like the and it was like on my like copy table with like some papers and it was like sitting there we're like playing games and then kazan like sees it and he's like what is this and i like grab it i'm like nothing, nothing. it's just it's like theoretical it's for a class like it's not nothing at all <laughs> like, you know, it was like this thick you know? that's amazing <laughs> God. all of that was built up to the invasion yeah Oh, that's, that's beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. So yeah if you're just willing to engage in a little fuckery you can make the biggest battle your kingdom's ever seen happen i mean that's kind of how the pineapple war for winter's edge happened Fair enough, too yeah like it's nowhere near i don't feel like anywhere near as good as as that story for we sure just didn't but... sell some newbie a breakable pole arm and then uh, go from there <laughs> right i'll make the pole arm because i can't make pole arms <laughs> yeah, we we even um we we invited dragon's keep to the invasion by we drove the Lost Woods crew drove an hour and a half. We made a parchment that was like an old parchment, like giving them the details and inviting them. <laughs> we drove an hour and a half to their park before they arrived, and we stuck the parchment in a tree with an arrow and left. We didn't even stay. So they, oh my gosh! <laughs> so they just came up to their park and like got the like invasion plan, like and then they you know showed up. So that's so. Good. This is a thing that can only happen pre-social media, right? It's so if, true. If this happened now, somebody get on Facebook and be like, "Who vandalized the tree at our park?" But like, <laughs> if it didn't exist, I'd go, "Well, I gotta go to find out what's going on." Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh God, that's good. Um. So I say we we wrap here. Uh, I'll roll the outro and then we story time at the area to get the rest of these. Absolutely, and and tell the thing that you want. I, I I may have spoiled your point, but tell the thing you uh, that you wanted to do. We now have a uh, a Patreon. Oh God, I was like, I have to tell a story. Oh God, no. <laughs> um, yeah. So just over the holidays, we put up a Patreon. We're currently doing um, an actual play, like uh, uh, not D and D, Monster of the Week campaign, um, and it's actually been a lot of fun. 
Um, so the first three episodes went up on YouTube and uh, you'll continue to get those episodes kind of on a, a trickle out basis. Um, problem is it's hard to get them all at once and get them edited. So uh, if you've listened to those, I actually did a lot more soundstage editing on those than I've done on any of the normal podcast stuff. Um, so you'll get like one a month, but if you want to get those quicker, like as we record them, um, you'll get those on Patreon. I think it starts at like a dollar 99 cause that's what Patreon makes us do. Um, and yeah, you'll also get some behind the scenes stuff and some of the stuff that doesn't necessarily make the cutting room floor, like what we're about to start here. Um, there's also a couple of bits up there. There's one we did with one Joe, uh, where we discuss exactly how colorblind I am. And oh, he yes. has that video that's, that's up there as well. Um, he actually pulls up a screen thing and like shifts his colors to show like, here's how I got to where you are. And oh my God. Um, so there's a lot of cool content there like that. Um, mostly it just goes to supporting the, the podcast. Um, like Flo's been saying, we got to buy new SD cards and stuff like that. Basically every dollar we've gotten goes into either our zoom subscription, uh, which is actually more expensive than I think it's worth. Weirdly expensive. Yeah. And then like replacement cables and stuff like that. So it all goes back into the show. If you want to support and us, plane tickets. check us out on Patreon. I'll have it in the, the links down below. Can I can I pitch something real quick? Yeah, please go. Okay, so um, there's this thing called Folding at Home. It's a, a program that was started about 20 years ago by Stanford mm-hmm. University, where people can cloud compute, uh, share computing power from your PCs at home, and it uh, does folding proteins for fighting you know COVID, Alzheimer's, ALS, all kinds of different diseases. Um, and you can just run it on your computer whenever you want. Well, when COVID started the seraphim fighting company started a seraphim fighting company folding at home team and right now we have uh we've had probably 10 different amp guarders throughout the two years add to it but right now we have a a core of like six people that do it um but again this program what it does is it uh, it uses cloud computing all around the world to do protein modeling and then it's open source and they share it with every laboratory in the world for free this is what like the COVID vaccines were created with, um, oh, awesome. like the research from it. So uh, where I'm going though is, I want to invite anybody in AmpGuard to join the Seraphim fighting um, <clears throat> fighting company, folding at home team. If you want, you just download the program. It's called Folding at Home. It costs nothing. You you download it. The uh, the the Seraphim fighting company ID is two six zero two nine four. You just set it up in your client. We have. Um, in the last two years, we have completed 4,373 work units, oh, wow. and we're in the top 3,600 teams out of hundreds of thousands Sitting in the down. entire 20-year history yeah, of holding home. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. If you liked what you heard, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on YouTube or Spotify to get notified about new episodes. And make sure to follow us on Facebook for announcements and more.